Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Julie. For those of you who are new, as Mike said, I'm part of the Vineyard staff team, and we are in week five of the series we're calling Unstuck. If you have missed any of the first four weeks and you want to listen or watch those, you can do that on the website, you can do that on the app, and now on the podcast. So lots of ways to do that. But we've been talking about things in life or situations in life that might cause us to feel or truly be stuck. And then we've been taking a look at the biblical perspective and the Christian faith as far as how that says we can become unstuck or not get ourselves stuck to begin with. So this week, we're going to talk about something else, something that can get us stuck, and we may not even realize that it's gotten us stuck. And it's something that in a place, especially like the United States, everybody deals with to some extent. Some of us more, some of us less. It's something that we have control over. In fact, in your own life, you're the only person who really has control over this. But it's also something that might make us a little uncomfortable. In fact, as I was working on this message, I feel like God was really preaching to me that, Julie, you've got to be in tune with this and pay attention to this on a very regular basis. And Jesus talked a lot about it. And it is something that, in all honesty, if we are Christians, if you are someone who believes you're part of the kingdom of God, we have got to consider this on a regular basis, maybe a daily basis even, or we will find ourselves stuck by it. And what we're talking about is stuff. The stuff that you have, that you own, that you enjoy, that you use to some extent, the stuff that you need in life. And your stuff comes in a lot of different forms. The, the primary form is money, because usually if you want any of the other stuff, somebody wants some of your money to give you the other stuff. But it also has different values to different people. You know, back when I was in college, I had the opportunity to do a lot of outdoor stuff, hiking and biking and diving and climbing. And so all the stuff that I needed to do those things was really important to me. It had a value, a high value. And I, I had a pair of awesome Birkenstocks too, and I should have kept them because those have come back around, that trend. But now, fast forward to my life now, and I get really excited about, you know, a kitchen tool or a great vacuum. You know what I mean? That's the stuff I value. It's awesome. And sometimes we value stuff that other people don't value. In fact, at my house, we have a, a spot outside our house where my husband has a lot of his stuff. And it's stuff that I don't really understand. I don't even know the names of all of it. I don't know the value of it. And I've kind of affectionately come to call it Donnie's Junkyard. And, you know, it's not real kind. But I said to him, you know, it's been there for 10 years. No one's stolen it. It's not the nicest stuff, right? And he, he said to me the other day, you know, you've got stuff hanging all over our walls and sitting around the house. It's been there for over 10 years. No one's stolen it. So, you know, my junkyard just is displayed on our walls in our house. But, but really, we don't always value the same things. But there's something that we value. So what about you? You know, what do you value in life? I mean, just think about it. Maybe it's a motorcycle. Maybe it's a car. Maybe it's a truck or a boat. Or, or maybe it's your house. You know, you've put a lot of effort into your house and building a nice home or your land or, or your livestock. Or maybe you're really into gardening. And so you've put a ton of resource and time and energy into your garden. Or maybe it's something like jewelry. You know, you really treasure really nice jewelry or, or clothes. You're into the latest trends. And so shopping and clothing and how you dress really means a lot to you. Or, or you know, I've known athletes who really value, I mean, every good athlete really values their equipment, their shoes. If it gets ruined or it breaks or it falls apart, you're going to go replace it. And that's, and that's something valuable to them. There are other people who, who are just maybe not a, an athlete of a particular sport, but they're just, you know, CrossFit junkies or something like that. And their gym membership is really something they value and it's important to them. Something that I bet a lot of us value is our cell phone. I mean, if my cell phone or your cell phone falls in the toilet after church, are you just going to be kind of like, eh, I wasn't using it, you know, and you just don't replace it? Probably not. I mean, you probably are going to want that again. But anything that we put our energy into, our time into, our money into, our resources into, anything we value, that's the stuff we're talking about today. And that is stuff that we really treasure in life. And Jesus says something about what we treasure. He actually says a lot about what we treasure. But one thing he says is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 21. And he says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, this word heart is used over 800 times in the Bible, and it doesn't mean the organ that pumps the blood through your body. Never is it used that way. But what it means is the will or the intention of a person, the things that you care about in your life. So if you want to know kind of where my heart is, my will, my intention, you might think, well, I'll listen to what she has to say on a Sunday morning like this, or, or I'll ask her to see the Bible she uses to study, and, and I'll see what she's highlighted or the notes she's written. But, you know, really, that could just mean that I've got a highlighter and some pens, and, you know, we can get up and we can say anything. 
If you really want to know where my heart is, I think there are two places you can look that will show you the most. The first one is my calendar. How do I spend my time? And the second one is my bank account. How do I spend my money? Because, see, we can know our Bible. We can learn the Christian lingo. We can come to church. But how we spend our lives, our time and our resources, really shows where our heart or our will or our intention with our life is. It shows what we value. Now, I know a lot of us here can, may be in the situation with all that's gone on recently where you're saying, man, I'm just lucky if I've got five bucks right now. And that can be a hard place to be when you don't have a lot of stuff. I know that my husband and I had a season in life years ago where we didn't have a job, neither one of us. We didn't have insurance. We had three little kids. That was a tough place to be. And God provided. I, I've lived in a place where I made a buck fifty a day. You know what I mean? There are times in life where we don't have as much stuff. But here's what I've learned through that. When we don't have very much, we hang on to it because that's all we have. And when we have more, we hang on to it because we finally got it and we don't want to lose it. And that's just our human tendency. That's just kind of how we're wired. And in and of itself, stuff isn't bad. It's just stuff. But what we're going to see today is that when our stuff becomes our treasure, our treasure will get us stuck. But there's one question we can ask ourselves on a regular basis that really will help us determine, am I going to let my stuff get me stuck or not? And that question is this, who owns your stuff? Are you the owner of your stuff, or has God given you stuff that you now manage, that you now steward? See, if if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, God isn't as concerned about how much or how little we have, but what he is very concerned about is our heart in regard to whatever we have in this life. And so I'm going to invite you to take a little action with this today. Um, In your program, you should have a couple index cards that look like this. And a pen, you may have to share the pen, but you can give a card to someone nearby you if they don't have one. So go ahead and take that out, please. And um, just play along, just have some fun with this. So I want you to start thinking about something or some things that you really value in your life, that you treasure, that you enjoy, that if it got ruined or broken or lost or stolen, you'd probably want to replace it. And I want you to go ahead and write that thing or those things. You don't have to write all of them if you've got a lot of them. You can just write a few on your card. And I'm going to tell you what I wrote on my card. Um, I wrote my phone my car, and my coffee maker. So you can see how shallow I am, right? (laughs) But really, my phone and my car, those are my two primary connections to my family and and my work. And my phone isn't just a phone. I mean, my phone is, you know, it's my calendar. I can pay for things with it. It's my, it has a bunch of Bibles on it. You know, it's got all these apps. It's my camera. It's not just my phone. Now, the coffee maker, that might be a little bit more frivolous, um, you know, but I found that I really like a cup of coffee in the morning. When I don't have it, you know, that's a bummer. I might even want five some morning. So anyway, that's what I wrote. So jot down those things that you value, that you treasure, that you really like having, and then just hang on to that card, and we're going to pull that back out in a little bit. But we're going to look at two interactions that Jesus had with two different men about getting stuck by stuff. And we're going to be mostly looking at Luke chapter 18 and 19. So you can uh, open your Bible if you've got a Bible with you to, to, to Luke 18. And as we begin to read, to give you a little context, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's walking to Jerusalem for this giant feast, a festival they're going to have. And at this time, Jesus is wildly popular with the public common people. But he's hated by the religious leaders. And he knows that these religious leaders during this time are plotting to kill him. And he also knows that by the end of this week, they will wrongfully accuse him and he will die an innocent man on a Roman cross. Now, I don't know about you, but if I knew that's what was coming at the end of the week, I'd like to take vacation and head to the beach or the mountains or something. I wouldn't do that. But Jesus, he keeps walking towards that. And while he walks there, he continues to tell people how they can become part of the kingdom of God. So as Jesus is walking, this man comes up to him and asks him a question about how he cannot be stuck when he dies. And you can read about this in Matthew and Mark and Luke. They all tell this story. And we never learn this guy's name. We just, he's just called the rich young ruler. But we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. It says this, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one's good except God alone. And I love this. Jesus is like, wait, before I answer your question, 
who do you really think I am? Because I'm, if I'm really good, then I'm God, because God's the only good one. And if I'm God, then I know the answer to your question. And if I know the answer to your question and I give it to you, you should probably do what I say, because I'm God. And so then Jesus goes on and he begins to answer this guy's question. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And when you read Matthew's retelling of this story, he sums it up. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And this young man would have known that this was the part of the Ten Commandments that had to do with how you interact with other people. And so he responds to Jesus and he goes, all these I've kept since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. See, Jesus is basically saying, if you have really kept all these commands, if you have really loved your neighbor as yourself, then put your money where your mouth is. Go give to all those neighbors who don't have as much as you everything you have. In other words, Jesus is kind of calling this guy to honesty. Like, are you telling me you've kept all these commands perfectly? Because nobody can keep these commands perfectly except God. But even more than this, Jesus is seeing who does this guy really think I am? Who does he think he's talking to? Because again, if you believe I'm God, if you want eternal life in the kingdom of God, then you will have no problem doing what I say and then trusting me to provide whatever you might need. And remember, there's a big crowd with Jesus and they're traveling and they're all listening to this interaction. You know, this guy, he had sought out Jesus. He had called Jesus good. He had initiated this question, really a question about life and death. And then his response is sadness and silence. And we read this. It says, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And he turns and he walks away. And then Jesus makes a statement to everyone who's listening. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? And when you read Matthew and Mark's telling of the story, it says they were greatly astonished. They were amazed because the belief was if you were wealthy with earthly wealth, then you were good with God. You were set. God had blessed you. You were, you were taken care of. And Jesus is saying that's not necessarily the case. That's not the determining factor. In fact, sometimes it's harder for people who have a lot to step into the kingdom of God. And you know, we can do the same thing. We can look at people who have a lot more than us and say, if I had what they had, I would be set and I would just trust God, no problem. But see, that's what this rich ruler was saying. He was basically saying, I've behaved well. I've gained all this wealth. I've built my kingdom. I am set. I have done my job. I have my kingdom. So God, just tell me what I need to do so that I'm good in the life after this. But the thing is, eternal life in the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of this man or the kingdom of me or the kingdom of you. So Jesus had begun with this question to clarify, whose kingdom do you really want to be part of? Your kingdom or my kingdom? Because so often the kingdom God of God that we think of is just after this life when we die. You know, you've probably heard someone say, and actually the Bible even explains that you've come into the world with nothing and you're going to leave the world with nothing. And we kind of understand, I can't take the car with me. I can't take the vacuum cleaner with me when I die, you know? But Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is actually something we enter into while we are still here on earth. He's saying that, yes, the location changes, but not the ruler. You start here and you continue on into the kingdom of God after you die. In fact, if you want to be the kingdom of, in the kingdom of God, you have to recognize God as the ruler now in this life because after this life, it's too late. Here's the thing that Jesus didn't say that this guy's wealth was bad or that he had too much. He didn't comment on how he got his wealth. He, he didn't even say this guy couldn't be rich again someday. But he did say you've got to make a decision about who's in charge of your life, who's ruling your world, all your stuff. And this rich young ruler wasn't willing to relinquish rulership of the kingdom that he'd built to step into the kingdom of God. He didn't want to give up ownership. He didn't want 
to, to relinquish his stuff. But see, if I own my stuff, I get to decide what to do with it. But if God owns my stuff, then I manage it. I steward it, which means God tells me what to do with it. See, if this man really wanted eternal life in the kingdom of God, it wasn't enough for him to just go to church and just read his Bible a little bit. God doesn't ask to be God of like certain categories of our life. God says, no, I'm, I'm God, like of all of your life. So he's either going to be God of all or, or God of nothing. And so again, we got to ask ourselves, who owns our stuff? I have, I have a friend who's a part of this church family who will go unnamed, but he has a business, quite a few businesses actually, and he kind of runs them all on his own. He's pretty independent with it. And we were talking a couple weeks ago, and he said, you know, in my businesses, I really try to talk to God throughout my day about what client to take and how to do my job and what to charge people. And a couple weeks back, he did a job, and he was praying about this, and he was asking God, hey, what should I charge for this job I just did? And he really believed God said, I want you to charge him half of what you usually charge. And he said to me, I don't know why God told me that. I mean, and it was hard to obey that because, you know, I could have made twice as much, but, but I've learned that it's God's and I've got to obey him. He's given me the business. He's given me the ability. And when I obey him, it works much better. He said, you know, Julie, when we talk to God and we ask him these questions, we say, what should I do? He will tell us in situations like this exactly what to do. And I said, well, that's why I wouldn't have asked God. I would have just charged the full amount, <laughs> right? Really, I mean, it's, it's, it's so different when you recognize God is the owner. When it comes to your job, your abilities, your talents, your resources, who owns your stuff? Because if we say we own it, we start to play God. But if God owns it, then we enjoy it. We use it. We appreciate it. We steward it. And we are responsible to God for it. When John Wesley, who's one of the uh, founding ministers of the Methodist movement, found out that his house had been burned to the ground, somebody came running and told him, and it says he, he paused for a minute, and then he said this. He said, the Lord's house burned. One less responsibility for me. He had this perspective of it's God's. See, when we heard Jesus say in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be, right before this, Jesus gives a little warning Here's what he says. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. In other words, there's no guarantee with our stuff here. It can be gone when we're least expecting it. And if you were here last week or went online, you heard Chris explain that this is happening to quite a few of us in our community. That there, that there are jobs and resources that we've been counting on and, and it looks like they're going to be gone. This can happen anytime to any of our stuff. My daughter hopped in the car after work one day a month ago and headed out to run some errands. And less than 15 minutes later, she's struck by another vehicle and she's fine. Praise God. So is the other driver. But the car was done. I mean, she hasn't had a car since then. You know, so at any point in time in this earth, our stuff can just be taken. Our stuff will fail us because it's just stuff. Jesus continues. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Have you ever had something stolen from you? I've had this happen like multiple times in my life. And one of these times it happened to me and, and my husband, Donnie, it was a number of years ago. Our family had outgrown the vehicle we had, so we went out and we found a vehicle that was a little bigger. And we thought, well, we better sell our other vehicle to help pay for the new one. And we had a coworker who had become a friend. And we said, hey, you know what? Let's, we, we prayed about it. And we thought, well, let's give him a great deal. We'll just give him the best deal we can. And we'll just do it on a handshake, no contract. That's really what we believe we were supposed to do. And then less than a month later, he hightailed it. He, he, he left town with the car and a bunch of other stuff. Never saw it again. And at first, I was really mad at him. I was like, how could he do that to us? He just stole from us blatantly. And we're trying to help. And then I was really convicted about it. Because what I started to realize, you know, God provided that car. God provided the next car. So was I going to put my trust in God continuing to provide stuff when I needed it? Or was I going to put my trust in me chasing down some guy who'd, who'd gone halfway across the country and try to get my stuff back? And when you live like that, when you understand, wait, God owns it. It's his. There's this incredible freedom that can come from that. See, when Jesus warns us not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth, he's telling us that because he loves us and he does not want us to rely on the wrong things, the things that will ultimately fail us. But he goes on and he says this, 
in Matthew 6, 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's saying, beware of making the temporary your treasure. Begin to make the eternal your treasure. Well, as Jesus continues on towards Jerusalem, he runs into another guy, and he has this encounter, and this is also another wealthy, very wealthy man. And we read this in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, we don't know Zacchaeus' backstory, but he's a Jewish guy who's not only a tax collector, but a chief tax collector. So in other words, he's gotten very, very rich from stealing from others, probably the others who are in this crowd following Jesus because he's a regional tax collector. And so no one moves out of the way for Zac. Nobody likes Zac. He's, he's hated by the Jewish people in general. And so in verse 4, it says, So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And now we don't know for sure, but it's very interesting to, when you realize that um, Zacchaeus may have been intrigued by Jesus because there's another tax collector named Levi who gets renamed Matthew, who had left his tax collecting business to follow Jesus and becomes one of Jesus' disciples. See, most of these Jewish rabbis, like Jesus, hated the tax collectors. But evidently there was something so appealing about Jesus that Matthew, Levi, gave up this white collar life of crime and wealth to follow Jesus. So Zacchaeus most likely had heard about this and he really wants to see who this guy Jesus is. And then we read this in verse five. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter about Jesus. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. And, you know, we read through these stories in like, you know, a couple minutes or something. But in this original Greek language, as you really read it and study it, you see that this was not a quick event. It wasn't just swinging by Zach's house for a cup of iced tea. Like he walked his house with him and he spent the time with him. And he, they probably shared a meal together. And so as Jesus spends this day with Zacchaeus and his friends and, and his people and his family, there's a shift in Zacchaeus' life. And there's actually a heart change. And we know this because then it says in verse 8, this. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, most likely Zacchaeus probably would have had plenty of money still to live on, but he was the chief tax collector. When you've cheated the whole region, that's a lot to pay back. I mean, if you heard Zach is paying back, you know, in the, the morning news, like you'd take a sick day, you'd get in line. I mean, that would have been awesome. That would have been a lot of money. And then listen to Jesus' response to Zacchaeus' decision. Jesus said to him, today, salvation, that eternal life, that kingdom of God has come to this house but not because of what you're doing, but because what you're doing has shown what kingdom you are choosing to be part of. See, for the first time, Zacchaeus was concerning himself and finding his purpose in building the kingdom of God, not just the kingdom of Zacchaeus. He moved from being owner to being manager of his stuff. And these two men that Jesus encountered, they had so many similarities. You know, they're both men. They both sought out Jesus. They're both Jewish. The primary thing they had in common is they both were wealthy, and therefore they were known by people as a man of wealth. But the way they got their stuff was very, very different. I mean, the, the rich young ruler, he had tried to love his neighbor as himself and follow the commands, and he became wealthy, and he was respected, whereas Zacchaeus blatantly did not try to love his neighbor as himself, and he was hated for his wealth. So how did Zacchaeus find salvation while the rich young ruler didn't. I mean, was it just because Zach gave away a bunch of his stuff? No, that's not what it was at all. Remember, Jesus told the rich young ruler, sell all your stuff. But we don't know that he ever told Zacchaeus to sell anything or pay anyone back. We're not told that. But the differences that mattered between these two men were, men were the differences of their heart, of their will, of their intention with their life and with their stuff. 
I mean, maybe you read that the rich, or remember that the rich young ruler went from Jesus in sadness. He left Jesus in sadness and walked away, where Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus gladly. And maybe you remember that, that the rich young ruler, he said, good teacher, where Zacchaeus called Jesus Lord multiple times. And that may sound like a really subtle difference, but that's actually a really big deal. You know, back in week one of this series, I shared with you how during my preparation and, and actually throughout this whole series, God has really challenged me with the question, will I let him be Lord? And you know, that is a very defining question when we're in any situation where we feel stuck. Because if we just see God is somebody out there and not really as our Lord, we will probably remain stuck. But if we see him as our Lord and our God who loves us and is watching over our lives and providing for us, we most likely will become unstuck as we put our trust in him. If you choose to let him be Lord of your life, you begin to recognize he has ownership of your stuff and you're the manager. And when that happens, you begin to store up for yourself eternal treasure in heaven because you begin to honor the relationship with God and it becomes a partnership with God as you journey through this life. See, the rich young ruler said he wanted salvation, but really what he wanted was fire insurance. He wanted to be saved from something. But salvation isn't just being saved from something. Salvation is being saved for someone, for a relationship with God. And Jesus never says he sells fire insurance. What he offers is lordship in our lives. See, both of these men, they gained their status in life through their wealth, through their stuff. And Jesus never said their wealth was bad. In fact, managed well, wealth can be an incredible blessing in this life. When we look across the lives of people in the Bible, we see many, many godly men and women who God just blessed with a ton of stuff in this life. It's not about how much stuff you have or how little stuff you have. But again, it's about your perspective, your intentions with your stuff. It's about answering who owns your stuff. Is it from the hand of God on loan to you for the time that you have here on earth to steward? Or is it yours to build your kingdom? And again, the truth is when your stuff becomes your treasure, your treasure will get you stuck because you can't have one foot in your kingdom and one foot in the kingdom of God. Jesus says it this way in Luke 16. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. In other words, you cannot serve both God and money. So is he saying just go sell everything? Is that what he's saying? I mean, should I just go say, Donnie, we're selling your junkyard? You know, I mean, maybe I'll pray about that and talk to him about that. But, <laughs> but no, you know, this isn't necessarily what this is saying. See, on this side of life, here on earth, we need stuff. God knows we need stuff. And I'll tell you what, I think God loves to give his kids some really nice stuff, just like a parent loves to give their kids something that their kid's going to love and enjoy. In fact, Jesus even puts it this way. He says in Matthew 7, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, I've known people in life who they try to give it all away, and God just keeps giving them more, just keeps dumping it on. But what happens when God does say, I want you to give it away? Because Jesus also says this in Mark 8. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, that salvation, the kingdom of God, will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And then he goes on and he has a question that he asks. Because there will be times, if you are a follower of God, a child of God, part of the kingdom of God, that he asks you to give up something that you don't want to give up. And so Jesus kind of says, look, I'm just going to lay it on the line. I'm going to make it really clear. And he asks this question. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? He's saying, you know, I love you, but it's that serious. Who owns your stuff? So 
earlier I asked you to write some of the things you, you, you really enjoy and treasure on this little card. So take that out again, if you would. And I want you to take, take that card and just kind of put it in your hand like this. Kind of hold your stuff. So you got your hand, you're holding your stuff in your hand. And I want you to think, if somebody walked up to you right now, and, and this was really the stuff you treasure, you value, you, you, you like, and they were going to try to grab it and take it and steal it and run, you'd probably do this, right? I mean, instinctively, you, you hang on to it. And then if they came and they tried to pry your fingers open, you'd probably turn your hand down and, you know, draw it in. And, and see, this is the posture we have when we own our stuff, when we control our stuff. It's, it's something we guard tightly and we try to protect. But you know what's interesting, too, is that it's really hard to add anything to your hand when your hand is in a fist like this hanging on to all your stuff. So while you're holding your stuff, I want to tell you actually about a well-known trap to catch monkeys that hunters use to catch monkeys. And they use a variety of different objects to do this, but one of the common objects that they use to do this is a coconut. Thank you so much, Mike. And, and they'll take a coconut or another similar object, or they'll find a, a, a hillside they can do this in, and they'll cut a hole in the coconut, and then they'll fill it with like fruit or some other treats or something like that, some bait. And then the monkey will come over, and the thing is that the, the the hole is small enough for the monkey to fit his hand in when his hand's open. But then he reaches in and he grabs the stuff and then he tries to get his hand out, but the hole is not big enough for him to get his fist out. So his hand is stuck. So the, I know, isn't it so sad? So the hunters, they hang the coconut on the tree or again, put it in a hillside or something like that. And then the monkey comes up and he sticks his hand in and you're, you're going to get to see a little video. He'll stick his hand in and he grabs the stuff inside the coconut. But then he can't get his hand out because he's not willing to open his fist. Did we see the video? Okay, great. I want you to know at the end of the video, he's petting the monkey, feeding the monkey. He's very nice to the monkey. It's all, it's all fine. But the thing is, here's the thing. The monkey is stuck by his own choice. All he has to do to be free is let go of the stuff. And now, because he won't let go of the stuff, he sacrifices not only being stuck with his hand, he sacrifices his life because he's hanging on to the stuff. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, all this stuff, but forfeit their soul, their, their, their life? So if you're still holding on to your stuff, I hope you're still holding on to your stuff, I want you to open your hand if it's not open anymore and just put your palm up. You know, when we're holding our stuff like this, it's not really going anywhere, it's just kind of sitting there. Now somebody can take it right out of your hand but also realize somebody can put something in that hand. Your hand can be added to. And here's the thing. When we live like this and we say, God, it's all your stuff. I'm just the manager. I'm just the steward. It's unbelievable what God can do with our stuff. Yes, he may ask for us to relinquish some of it, but he also may add to our hands and our stuff. You know, our creative arts director, Matt Parsons, and his wife, Becky, they, they've been living like this, and they had a, an opportunity recently, actually just two or three months ago. They got a call, and they found out there was a baby who was in need of being adopted. And they started to pray about it and talk about it, and they really began to believe that God was telling them, I want you to, to pursue adopting this baby. And so before they even know if they, get, if they get the baby, they needed to make some changes. They realized if they did, they'd go from a family of four to a family of five, and their car wouldn't fit five, so they had to sell their truck that they really liked. So they sold their truck, and they got a, more of a family car. And then they realized, you know what, we might need some more funding. And so then Matt decided, well, I'm going to sell my motorcycle that I really, really, really like. And so he sold his motorcycle. And then they had to make some changes to their home and take some vacation days to, to go travel and, and, and meet some of the process requirements. And, and, and the thing is, they were living like this. And God said, I need you to give up some of your stuff. But God also said, but I'm going to place into your hands, into your care, into your stewardship, another life and everything that's going to come with that. And see, Matt and Becky we're living like this. If they weren't living like this, they'd be missing out on some amazing things that God is doing in their lives. And like my friend who, who prays daily, God, how do you want me to run this business? How do you want me to steward the abilities you've given me? He's living like this, hands open. And I know athletes who wake up and go, you know what? God's given me my talents, my abilities, and the physical ability to, to do this again for a day. God, Help me to honor you with what you've given me. And I know people who have homes that are 
much bigger than they need, or they have a little extra space, and they've said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And sometimes God says, I want you to offer that space up and let someone move in with you for a while. Because when you're living like this, you're saying, okay, God, you're the owner, and I'm the manager. I'm the steward. So, so what about you? Do you identify more with that rich young ruler, and it's just really hard to let go of your stuff? Or with Zacchaeus? And here's the thing. God knows we need stuff in this life. And because he knows we need stuff in this life, our stuff is one of the best, most consistent links we can have between God to continue to build that relationship with him. Because again, when he's the owner and we're the steward, we enter into this partnership with him in this life. And what happens is we begin to recognize our residence in the kingdom of God. And that relationship with him becomes the eternal treasure more than any of the stuff that we have. See, the thing is, when we are the owners of our stuff and of our life, we put a cap on what can happen in our life. It all depends on us. But when we live like this, recognize it's God's and manage it, he is a limitless God. It is limitless as far as what he can do with and through our stuff in our lives. And so I want to invite you this week, maybe start today, maybe tomorrow morning, maybe set an alarm. And it's real simple. Each day, just say to God, maybe you put your hands like this, say, God, how do you want me to manage what you've entrusted to me in this life? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you're a God who not only wants to bless us, but wants to be in a partnership with us as we journey through this life. And that you're a God who says, I have bigger plans for you than you could imagine for yourself. And that you're a God who, when you do take, you are ready to give. And God, we just thank you that you love us more than we love ourselves, that your desire is to provide for us, that your desire is to journey through this life with us. And so, God, I pray that you would speak to each heart and each mind today. God, I pray you would strike the words that were useless. God, that you would speak the words that are yours. And, God, that each one of us would be drawn more to you and knowing more of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.